There we go. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to, guess what, this is the fourth um, uh, webinar on plant biology and plant ID. Tonight, we are looking at those willows, a group of uh, plants that probably have a little bit of um, notoriety in terms of being a little bit challenged to, to identify. But I don't think it's really that, that bad. I think I'm gonna provide some good clues here for you to, to use. The opening slide here is a picture of a good number of pollinator, nectar feeders, pollen feeders, insects that utilize willow. Willow is, um, of course, it's in the family, say like KCE, and there's four genera worldwide. As you can see, they're listed up on the upper left there. And willow by far is the most diverse. The first number you see there, 450, is the number of species worldwide. And then the second number uh, in bold is the number of species that are known or at least uh, been recognized in North America, North of Mexico by FNA. And for a long time, it was just Salix and Populus. Those were the two genera that were in Salicaceae, but some recent um, systematic work looking at DNA and all the things that systematists look at and all the cladistical analysis that they do showed that there were a couple other groups of plants, um, Xylosma and Flacortia, that previously weren't in Salicaceae, but are, are, should be because they come out in the same clay, basically. So those are two that are, um, I don't know anything about those. And those two are quite a bit different from Salix and Populus in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, Salix and Populus uh, are dioecious. You see that term up there. They're all, they are uh, woody plants, of course, either shrubs or trees. But dioecious means that the flowers are unisexual. So there's, there's only male flowers and there's only female flowers. And those flowers are always found on different individuals. The other, those other two more obscure genera um, are not dioecious. Xylosma is a species, uh, um, the one species that does grow in North America is native and it's only found in, uh, in Texas along the Gulf Coast. And then the other one uh, that does grow in Florida is non-native. It's been um, in, introduced there, I think, for agriculture or something like that. But, but you can see again that uh, Salix is by far the most diverse um, in terms of genera and species. In Iowa, we have 12 native species of Salix and we have three native species of Populus. Anyone know what the three Populus species are? Anyone? Grandidentata. Granditata, which is big tooth aspen. And a real common one, deltoides, eastern cottonwood. Cottonwood. And then, of course, tremuloides, the uh, quaking aspen. So, some of the things that combine uh, both populus and salix in this diagram here, you can see I've, I've divided the, the diagrams by the uh, genus that are represented there. Um, they are alike, again, because of their simple alternate leaves. They are mostly stipulate, so most of the time the leaves have stipules, but it's a little bit tricky in, in, the, in the salix, for example. Uh, stipules are usually present at some time during the growing season on those leaves as they come out, uh, often earlier in the growing season. And then as the growing season continues, they can become deciduous, meaning that they fall off. So they're not always there, but um, we are gonna talk about stipules, at least some, because in some species, for some species, the stipules are very useful. And we'll see what those are again. Um, I, I have a glossary in this handout, if you hadn't noticed yet uh, at the very end, and there's a bunch of botanical terms there. Uh, including stipules uh, to help you with, with some of those terms. What really is, again, important is the um, flowers. They're, again, dioecious, so 
individuals are either male or female. And the flowers occur in catkins. A catkin is, well, like we see these things right here. A catkin is a very small spike or racine in terms of how the flowers are arranged. Uh, but it's a special situation. It's a special kind of spike or a special kind of racine uh, in that the flowers are um, without any petals. Apetalous is the term we use. So there's no petals. Uh, flowers are pretty well reduced in size, no petals. And um, again, they're unisexual. So a flower is either just a staminate flower, a male flower has stamens, or a flower is a pistil flower and has a pistil. Most of the time uh, in the willows, as we're going to see here, is those, those catkins are somewhat erect. They can be a little bit uh, lax. Um, here's another picture of some of a willow species, and the catkins are shown right here. In the populous species, the catkins are always drooping down, but in the in salix, they can be erect a little bit. So the sepals, which uh, again are present technically, but they don't look like sepals. They're they're either they are reduced so much that they're gone, but for most of the time, they're reduced to look like something else. They're modified, basically. They're reduced in size and they're mo modified in a way to uh, not look like sepals at all. In the uh, populace, they are form sort of a little cupular disc type of structure, this thing that we see right here. And the the disc-like structure then has the flowers attached to it. And then um, in the salix, though, the the sepals are reduced and, and modified to be nectary glands. Because as you saw in the first picture there, uh, salix attract insect pollinators. Pollination in salix is both wind and insect pollinated, while in populus, it's only wind. Both uh, populus and salix will have capsules for their fruit. Here's a capsule right here. It's a dry type of fruit that splits open and of course releases uh, bunches of seeds. The seeds are comos. That means that they've got a little tuft of hairs at one end of the seed. Here uh, for salix, which of course is tonight's uh, goal, we can see uh, a staminate flower right here, reduced down to just a scale. So this thing back here is a, is a bract or a scale that subtends the flower. And the flower is just reduced to two stamens and then a nectary uh, gland right here. And over here is a pistillate flower with again a scale. The scales are usually always pubescent and have hairs on them, as you'll see in some of the pictures, and with a single pistil. And again, a nectary gland right here. So how do we separate? I've got already talked a little bit about how we separate salix and populus. As it, as it shows here, the catkins can be either erect or slightly lax or even pendulous. Uh, in salix, but in populus, they're always hanging downward. Here we see uh, in this diagram down here, these, uh, these two are populus and these two are salix. And again, it shows the female catkins on the left and the male catkins on the right. A couple other things, though, that are helpful for separating salix from those populars are the number of bud scales. So um, here we see a, a couple of buds on a salix. Remember, again, salix is the top row, populus is the bottom row. And what we're talking about are these scales that protect the marismatic tissue that's present in a bud. And in salix, again, there's this one scale that surrounds the entire bud. What, one thing that becomes important, as you'll see a little bit later, is whether that scale is fused, um, where the margins come together, whether, whether those margins are fused together, or whether those margins are overlapping. But in populus, and, and this is a cottonwood down here, there's multiple scales. So here's a, these, these buds here are gonna be flower buds. Uh, these buds over here are gonna uh, turn into twigs with, with leaves on them. 
But in either case, uh, there's there's a, probably three or four uh, scales there. And as I said, the calyx is mod modified to form a nectary in the willows, and it's this, this cupular disc. Again, you can see the cupular disc right here for a female flower and um, over here. So it's kind of a flattened out disc type structure. But in, um, again, in salix, it's a nectary. And again, here's a picture that shows the female flowers. Uh, here's that bract that we saw in the previous di diagram. Here's a nectary gland here and here. This shows again the um, ovary down through here, the style up through here. Uh, this one's got some hairs on it. This is again a few uh, male flowers up here, again with their bract that subtends the flower, and again, nectary glands. In salix, there's far less stamens in each flower. Most of the time, there's just two stamens. Um, sometimes there's three or more. But down in the populus, you can see there can be lots of stamens, anywhere from six to 60. The carpels in salix are, there's always just two carpels that fuse together to form a compound pistil here. And most, most of the time you always see maybe two style branches up at the top. And that means that also when the fruits split open, they split open uh, into two sections, into two valves. In populus, there can be anywhere from two to four carpels that are fused together. And again, depending upon the number of carpels, uh, that's the number of valves that split open uh, when those capsules open up. As far as leaves go, uh, what this means is that the blades in most salix are at least two times longer than they are wide. Whereas in the populous species, the blades are typically less than two times longer than they are wide. All right, any questions? That's some basics just on cellular KCE and then separating the, the two genera. I'm going to go ahead and jump now to the um, handout. So I'm gonna bring this down and bring this up. Again, what I did for you in the handout, um, I hope this is helpful. This takes quite a bit of time and work. I put together a table here, like I've always done, which uh, is going to list all 12 native species. And again, uh, shows the nomenclature as far as flora of North America goes since the uh, Sailor Casey art had been done by um, George Argus, who was the author for Flora of North America for this group. We can put the current accepted correct scientific name according to Florida North America. So that's what's here. And then again, the status, whether it's, well, they'll be native or whether it's got some kind of endangered status. And then coefficient of conservatism, which again is a number from one to 10 that, that um, determined by a group of botanists kind of uh, gives, gives you an idea of how, um, how much affinity a species has for highly pristine natural ecosystems. The higher the number, the more likely it is those species are really only found in some of the best natural pristine places that we have left. The lower the number, the more it's um, a little bit, when we get down into the ones, twos, maybe even the threes, it's a, it's a little bit more of an early successional kind of weedy species. The second column here has the nomenclature as far as Eilers and Rosa go, our only uh, guide to the vascular plants of Iowa in terms of nomenclature and provides a common name. And with the willows, there are lots of hybrids. The willows are very good at hybridizing, which means, which is to say they are, they are very good at uh, outbreeding basically and producing uh, at least a viable offspring that it can at least grow and be present in the environment. Now, whether in theory that offspring cannot reproduce, but it can persist. And of course, since plants can reproduce vegetatively, and that's especially true in, in Salicaceae, Salicaceae uh, populace and Salix you know, are very good at, at clonal growth, primarily because of uh, the shoots that can come up off of underground rhizomes or suckers that can come up from, from roots. 
uh, and and spread as a as a clone. In, in fact, uh, one of the largest clones known is a um, clone of trembling aspen out in Utah called Pando. Anyway, getting back to this, then the third column here has some habitat information. And what you're going to see here is, for the most part, most of the willows are pretty much similar habitat. Uh, there are some differences, but they like um, wetland areas, damp areas, damp soil, and stream banks and shorelines is a common place you're going to see all the way through here. Now, there are a couple of species uh, that are uh, associated with peatlands, uh, and there's one right here, Salix candida, bends, uh, calcareous peat, peatlands. Uh, but for the most part, the habitat is pretty interchangeable, it seems like, for most of these species. Then I put together a map of Iowa counties that shows the biogeography where the populations are located in Iowa uh, from the standpoint, again, of, of recognizing, well, it's helpful to know where what you might have when you're looking at willows someplace. And you know you can look at these maps and see what, what willows are present in your county, for example. Uh, you know, If you're down here in, in um, Mills County, uh, you're not gonna see Salix babyana. It's not gonna be, be there. So one less willow for you have for you to worry about. And then always put in a, a bigger map that shows the biogeography for the entire United States so you can get the bigger picture of where these, uh, where these species are. So again, that's what's in this first table. Um, I will point out that some of these maps come from uh, Iowa prairie plants. Uh, because they are included in the Iowa Prairie Plants book. And so there is a, a ready-made map. I don't have to make the map myself. Um, some of the maps for species like Cetix lucida, which is an endangered species, shining willow, uh, I make from the Iowa Natural Areas Inventory, which is a database the DNR has that keeps track of, of endangered, threatened, and special concern species to get a better handle on again, how those species are doing and to make decisions about, well, what kind of listing the, the plant should have, whether it should, you know, what level it should be at. When, I, when you have an endangered or special concern or threatened species, then I, I use that database to give you some information about just how many populations are there that are at least known. That's this number right here. That's historically over all time, all known collections. And then what's even more, more important, of course, though, is to pay attention to how many uh, of those populations have been observed and verified uh, since 1980, which is now 40 years ago. Uh, because uh, in many cases, uh, it's far fewer populations uh, than what we see over here. And that, of course, means that there's 23 populations that we would put into the historic category, which means um, there's probably a good chance that they may no longer exist. Here's black willow, one of the most common species. There are, um, there's 12 native species here again, and there's roughly six of the willows um, do get to the size of trees. If we think about a tree being at least something that can get up to about 20 centimeters DBH in their trunk size. And then roughly the other half are, are shrub species. And the, the tree species would include um, peach leaf willow, that's the one that can get the biggest. Um, Bebs willow can get up to be a tree size. Um, Pussy willow, which is right here, be a small tree. Um, black willow uh, can get up to be a good tree size, up to 50 to 60 centimeters TBH. Shining willow can get up to be a small tree. And then um, Missouri willow, this one right here, uh, can also get up to tree size. All right, so that's what's going on in this table. Um, I'll also put in, uh, according to according to Eilers and Rosa, which of course, again, is dated. I always want to remind you that Eilers and Rosa is badly out of date, but at least uh, what they present for the synonyms um, so other species that, you know, were, those scientific names were used at one time, historically, to uh, name these species. That's what an equal means. So 
uh, Salix gracilis is a synonym for Pedialaris. Some of these also have varieties. So Salix humilis here, there's a couple of varieties that Eilers and Rosa list. And then this synonym, Tristis, but Tristis is now recognized as a variety of Salix humilis. And it's, it is a, another variety that occurs, but in Iowa, we only have one variety, uh, this one right here, which is a taller one. All right, then um, there are five non-native species of willows. I just list them here. Uh, only really two of them are, are really potentially, you know, something you would find uh, that you know are naturalized and occur often enough. That would be white willow, Salix alba, and crack willow, Salix fragilis. And, and of those two, crack willow is more common. These other three that have asterisk here, um, Siler, uh, Eilers and Rosa list them as being present in Iowa, and they certainly are, but they really rarely, if ever, escape from cultivation. And if they do, they, they often don't survive. And so they're really not naturalized very well. So if, they, if they're not, if a species is not native or not naturalized, then it's really not considered to be a part of the flora. Okay, and then table two, this took quite a while to put together. I've got the 12 native species and two of the non-native species here. And what I've done is just kind of put in a nice comparison table um, because it's really helpful to when you're kind of trying to narrow things down, look up some things here. Uh, the growth form is described here, whether it's you know mainly tree or shrub, multiple stems, how big uh, trunks can get for those tree types. And then um, what this shows, when we're looking at willows, since they, they tend to have fairly long slender leaves, uh, what's often used is the ratio of the length to the width. Because obviously leaves can be different sizes depending upon the time of year when you're looking at them, what part of the growing season. And, and of course, we always, always like to look at fully formed mature leaves, but uh, early in the growing season, you know, those may not be available. And rather than, you know, try to figure out a, a way to compare these leaves that's uh, independent then from that growth, a good way to do that is to just look at this length to width ratio, because that stays pretty consistent as the leaves grow, because they kind of keep the same shape. And so what you just you do is you take the length of the blade and divide that by the width of the blade, the, the widest part of the blade, and you get a number, of course, and that's what these numbers represent here. So, for example, peach leaf willow, the leaves are anywhere from three to six times longer than they are wide. That's what that means. And I also put in here uh, another characteristic that's helpful is to look at the petiole, the little stem that attaches the leaf to a twig or branch. And in some species, at the top of the petiole, right where the petiole and the blade come together, there can be some glands. Now we see there's no glands in any of these right here, but there are glands on some of them. Another characteristic that we'll use quite a bit is what does the lower blade surface look like, the ventral side of the, of the leaf blade? And you see some terms here to describe um, light bluish green, glaucous, glabrous. Glabrous means there's no hairs. Glaucous means there's this kind of a bluish white waxy thin layer that makes the, the color of the leaf more, more pale, light, light, light colored. And again, we'll, we'll look at this uh, to help us figure out what some of the species are, but here's again, each of those 12 or well, 14 species that plus the two non-native ones here that give you a good sense of kind of what that characteristic is like. Then um, the next column here has uh, some information about those stipules. Um, if they are persistent, if they're foliaceous, means they're kind of almost like a leaf. They're almost big enough to be kind of like a leaf. Um, if there are some measurements there, that's roughly how long those stipules are. Uh, sometimes, again, as I said, stipules are, are deciduous very quickly, and so they don't last very long, as in Pediolaris right here. Then the number of stamens in the staminate flowers. Um, if you have those, that can help to separate because roughly, well, most of them are two, but there's a few there. 
about four or so that are three or more. The capsules, which are the fruits, of course, again, and you can also look at the ovaries, you know, before the capsules are formed, it's the ovaries that are gonna form the capsules. So uh, the ovaries would be the same. Um, the ovaries are either gonna be glabrous or pubescent, because that's again, there's which situation that we see with those capsules. And then finally, I put some information about those catkins. Really what's of interest here is whether the catkins are forming simultaneous with the um, leafing out. In other words, the catkins are, are present as the leaves are forming and coming out or uh, are the catkins avail uh, present and doing their thing, the flowers you know, shedding pollen and collecting pollen before the leaves or even after the leaves. And then you see the length of the catkins, the rough length of the, the male catkins and the female. And sometimes you see there's quite a bit of difference in the, in the length of the catkins. So the catkins will persist, of course, quite a while. Uh, the, the staminate catkins will wither eventually and just kind of fall away. But the pistillate catkins will be present uh, for a long time because uh, those, that's where the fruits are. And so even into the summer growing season, uh, you could still use those uh, if it was helpful again to separate um, some, some species. All right, so that's what that is all about. Now we can go back to the um, PowerPoint here. And um, I'll do one of these slides and we'll take a, take a break as we usually do. So the first slide here, what we're gonna do Start, starting with identification is I'm gonna split the, this is just, I'm just dealing with the 12 native species here. Uh, we're gonna split them into three groups based on that length to width leaf blade. Remember it's the leaf blade. You don't include the petiole in that. It's just the blade. So the petiole is not included. And you see there's, there's five species here that are really consistent in that they have leaves that are at least five times or more longer than they are wide. A couple of these can have a ratio, gets down to 4.5, but I still put them in this group because they're, they're most of the time, they're, they're more, more than five. And then over here, there's a group that are on the other side, three species that are almost always really good, consistently always have a, this ratio that's less than five. So the leaves are less than, are, are, are less than five times longer than they are wide. Then you have this group of four that are troublesome because it, it just depends. It, again, you, when, you, when you're doing this, and, and this is gonna be true for any of the characteristics that you're gonna be using here, you wanna look at several leaves. You wanna measure this on several leaves. If you're looking at stipules, you wanna look at several leaves and look at those stipules. If you're looking for uh, those glands on those petioles, you look at several petioles. You never ever just look at one uh, one thing and, and use that as your um, answer to the question of, of, of what it's got. You always want to look at several. And then you try and figure out, you know, what's the general situation here? What's, what's the preponderance? And so when you do that, then you'll sometimes come up with some leaves on the same plant. Some of those leaves will be less than five. Some will be greater than five. There's some place between 2.5 and 7.5 in terms of what that ratio is. So these four are a little bit difficult in that regard, uh, but we'll look at those as a group and again, uh, see how we can split those out. So what we're going to start with is these uh, five over here that have longer uh, leaves, more than five times longer than wide. And the first thing we're going to do is pull two of them out really easily because they're very pubescent on the lower blade surface. The lower surface of the leaf is just really densely pubescent, usually. There's always a possibility that there could be a few leaves that aren't uh, quite as pubescent. That's why you look at several. The two that are are sage willow and silky willow, uh, Salix candida and Salix sericea. And how you separate them, then you, well, you first of all, you can see uh, how just how hairy and pubescent these bottom surfaces are. It makes the bottom surface look really white because those hairs, and here you can see the hairs on, on um, silky willow here, are usually white to, to gray. The hairs on sage willow 
uh, appear as sort of a tangled mat of white to gray woolly hairs. So they're kind of just all tangled up and going every which way. Whereas the hairs on silky willow are, long, are fairly long and straight and they lie flat down against the leaf surface, all pointing sort of in one direction. So one way of saying it is these hairs are organized in a kind of uniform way. And these hairs over on sage willow are just going every which way. The other thing, of course, is that sage willow is a shrub that's about, at the best, 1.5 meters tall and is often found in peatlands, but it's not, it can be found in sedge meadows as well. But it, it is certainly something you would, you could certainly find in a peatland like a, like a fen. The margins of the leaves here, the leaf edges are entire, which means that they, they don't have any teeth, little, you know, little um, saw teeth uh, that occur along the edge. In fact, instead, the, leaf, the margins, you can kind of see it right here uh, on this one, the margins are, it's called revolute. That means that the leaf is turned down somewhat. The edge of the leaf is kind of turned down uh, and forms a little curl. Whereas in silky willow, the leaves are, we can't see it very well because it's not close enough uh, to see those margins, but the, the margins are somewhat finely serrate. Plus you see here that the surface of, the upper surface of the leaves in silky willow is really sh pretty shiny, um, medium green. And over here in sage willow, there's even some pubescence on the surface, the uh, top surface of these leaves too which makes them more of a grayish uh, dull green. Most of the time, um, we're not gonna be using any of the reproductive characteristics. As you can see, it says at the top, salish identification using vegetative morphology. Uh, when you use a key, and by the way, um, the best key for Iowa salix is the trees and shrubs of Minnesota because it has the best overlap with um, Salix that we have in I Iowa. Florida, Missouri doesn't have as much, uh, so it doesn't work as well. Um, but most keys and the, the key in the, the Minnesota book and the key in the Missouri book, what most authors do is they'll write three keys. <laughs> they'll write a key using staminate flowers, and then they'll write a key using pistolet flowers. And then they'll write a key using just vegetative char characters. Most of the time, again, I'm, I'm gonna focus on vegetative here because you know, most of the time, if you're, uh, unless you're there in the early part of the growing season in May, when the catkins are in their full glory, uh, you know, any other time of the year, uh, you're not gonna be seeing the flowers. You could be seeing fruits on the pistolate catkins, of course, uh, but you're not gonna be seeing uh, the flower part. So, uh, we're not going to really use them. I, I put a few pictures of, of the catkins in and some of these so you can kind of see what they look like, but we're not going to really focus on those characteristics very much. All right, let's take a, a quick uh, like four minute break or so, five minute break, and when we'll continue with um, the, the remaining. Um, well, we got two of the 12, so we got 10 more to go, 10 more species. Thomas, I, uh, how did you send out that uh, handout? I didn't seem to get it. Did you send it on your personal email? I give that to Lance and he mails it out to everybody. Yeah, I think a couple people didn't get it. I just resent it a little bit ago. So okay. you might have it now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Lance, I just got it. Thank you. Okay.
Darren Hanson. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, we got a couple. I guess I don't um, know if the, if the questioners are, are here though, so maybe, I don't know if we should wait or just, um, what, what are they? Um, let's see. So Lee asked at the end, please comment on conservative versus endemic. I see the second word in some textbooks, not specific to plants, but on ecology or biogeography. As defined in one book, endemic is very similar to conservative as used in the coefficients. Okay, that can come at the end. And then uh, what about Van der Linden's books, Iowa Trees and Shrubs and Vines? I'll talk about that <clears throat> at the end too. Okay, that's all we got right now. Okay, well, I'll wait one more minute and then we'll get going. It's a bit of trivia. There is a Salix, Iowa that's named after this. <laughs> that's right. Not too far from uh, the Lost Hills. Yeah. Out there, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> on that floodplain. Yeah. Which reading some of the history of the early pioneers, that it, it was that whole floodplain was just full of wells. <clears throat> I'm sure it was. Lots of willows. And lots of wet, wet prairie. The last remaining chunk of wet prairie in Iowa by uh, uh, Hitchcock Nature Center was a victim of the flood. It did, uh, it, it, it's not recovering very well. Last time I looked at it, it was a lot, lost a lot of species being underwater for several uh, weeks. That's the one up by Hitch Hitchcock. You're talking yeah, about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Been there. It'd still be interesting to get back on it again and take a look, see what survived closely. All right, folks, let's get started again. So we're going to continue to work with those willows in that blue box there, and we're going to pull out the other three and do that with a, just a little bit of a, a couple of couplets uh, using sort of a key structure there at the top, you see. And so we're going to start by looking again at the uh, at that leaf to width ratio. And if the leaves are really linear, which means they're really narrow, they're going to have a, a higher ratio, a length width ratio of 8 to 25. That takes you right to sandbar willow. That's one of the easiest ones because it has such these, these really narrow leaves. If it's um, that length to width ratio is a little bit less, I mean, it's still over five. We see here five to 11, those leaves are a little bit more elliptical or lancelet. Then it's one of these other two here. We separate black willow and meadow willow by looking at, again, the leaves and seeing if there's any glaucus, if there's a glaucus surface. And it's always going to be the ventral surface. If, if a willow leaf has this bluish white sort of um, waxy layer, uh, it's going to be on the bottom of the leaf. And so if they're not, then that's black willow. Black, black willow, both black willow and sandbar willow, the upper and lower surfaces are very similar. Uh, they're, they're almost the same tone of, of, of green, uh, sort of a medium green. Uh, if it is glaucus, then you can see this one over here. Again, we can see this big difference between the bottom and the top again. Now this time, this is not due to hair or pubescence, it's due to this uh, bluish whitish waxy layer. And again, the other thing here is the bud scale. I mentioned bud scales and uh, on meadow willow, Salix petiolaris, which is pretty common in uh, really you know, wet prairies and sedge meadows, uh, the, that bud scale is fused along its margin so that the scale is just one complete piece of tissue that completely uh, surrounds that bud. Whereas in black willow, uh, the margins are overlapping. What you can do is you, you take a, a little knife blade or a dissecting pen 
And you, you have to look on the side that's facing the twig. So you have to kind of pull the bud back a little bit. And on the side facing the twig, I just put my little knife in there or a, a needle and see if I can separate those overlapping margins of, of, the, of the bud. Or if, it, again, if you can't, because those margins are, are fused. So that separates those three out then. Again, remember these all have the, the leaves that are longer, five times more or longer than they are wide. Um, the largest leaves on sandbar willow and black willow are about the same. They get to about 15 centimeters long. The largest leaves on meadow willow are a little bit less, about 11 centimeters or so. Meadow willow uh, will have this uh, reddish, orangish, reddish brown, reddish purple coloration on the second year branchlets. So we're talking about the, the branches that are two years old or the, the growing season that would be their second year. That can be helpful. And um, oh, the other thing is these glands. So remember we said that some, some leaves on some species have glands at the top of the petiole. Well, black willow, can have glands. Black willow often has uh, glands present. Again, it's where the petiole, the top of the petiole and the bottom of the blade meet. And um, they're pretty small in black willow. Uh, they're not real conspicuous and they're not always there, uh, but they can be there at least on some leaves. Usually if you're looking at a, um, a tree and you're looking at several branches, it, they'll, they'll be present on at least some of them. Uh, you know, some of the leaves on some of the uh, on some parts of the tree. Uh, sandbar willow and meadow willow do not have uh, those glands at all. Another thing that we said you know, can take a look at, and I just put an example of a capsule over here, a capsule of meadow willow. Uh, again, that the characteristic you're looking for there is whether the capsule is glabrous, it doesn't have any hairs on it at all, or whether uh, it is pubescent and has, has hairs. And meadow willow is glabrous. All right, moving on to, oops, I went the wrong way. Moving on to that middle group now <clears throat> with the length to width ratio, either less than or greater than five. And we've got four species in this group. We're gonna pull out two on this page and then pull out two on the next slide. So the, the best way to pull them out really quick uh, and, and shining willow is, a, is when it comes out right at the top there, as you see, because it has prominent glands in the petiole. You can see this little diagram right here is, has an arrow pointing to the glands right there. And then I got a blow up picture right down here. Shining Willow has basically a, a cluster of glands uh, right here at the top of the petiole. Um, the others, all the rest of them here again, leaves without glands. And so these three again are keying out um, below that, that one. So shining willow has some other things though. It, it is, again, it's an endangered species in Iowa. It only occurs up in the northern part of the state, northeastern part of the state. I did have a, a potential sighting of a population in Des Moines, but I couldn't verify it. I need to go back to that site, I guess, and, and take another look. But there's some other things. Um, usually the stipules are very consistent and persistent and conspicuous. So again, these are the stipules right here. Stipules are paired little leaf-like structures. We could, we could almost like call them a bract. Um, again, but sometimes they are so significantly you know, large and green in size, they, they almost look like a little leaf. Uh, but there are always two of them. And again, they occur right at the base of the petiole where the petiole uh, again is attached to the stem. And then, Shining willow, as I said, they're, they're pretty conspicuous. You can see uh, that's a pretty large one right there. Um, another thing is the leaves are very long, tapering, attenuate the tips, the leaf tips. See how long tapering these, these leaf tips are. Now, peach leaf, which is the other one I'm keying out here with, it also has somewhat tapering leaf tips. That's a good characteristic for it. But you can see here that the um, Peach leaf is also characterized by having that glaucous ventral leaf surf surface. And shining willow doesn't have that. Um, these, this ventral surface might be just a little bit paler green than the top, but it's certainly not glaucous. 
in uh, May for Shining Willow, the uh, staminate catkins are really conspicuous. They're fairly large and they're really bright yellow, uh, as you can see in that picture there. And the other thing, uh, I, the reason I put this twig in is because Shining Willow also has uh, orange bud scales that will persist into the spring for a while after the buds have, open, have opened up and you know, you're getting a, a, a new twig growing there. Okay, so uh, this page again has Shining and Peach, but it has the key to separate the other two, which are gonna be on the next page. But so how are we gonna separate Prairie Willow? Uh, we're, we're separating Peach Leaf Willow from these other two right here. So again, Leaves glabrous and the lower leaf glaucus is peach, peach leaf willow. If the leaves are pubescent, at least on the petiole. Now, again, a leaf includes the stipules, the petiole, and the blade. All three of those are parts of a leaf. And so, if the petiole at least has some hairs on it, then, it, then there, there are still hairs on, on the leaf. The lower leaf can be various things here. That's going to separate um, prairie willow and Missouri willow from peach leaf. Now, how to separate those two apart is based on those hairs. On prairie willow, those hairs are going to be mainly white to reddish and mainly on the lower surface of the leaf blade. Whereas in Missouri willow, they're on the petiole. They're not really so much on the blade. They're on the petiole and they're more of a white to grayish hair. And we'll take a look at that. Um, some pictures of both of those species here on this, on this page then. You prairie willow over here in this group and Missouri willow right here. So prairie willow is a shrub too. That's the other thing that's of course gonna help as well. Well, both of these are shrubs, but prairie willow is a shrub that it doesn't get any more than two meters tall. That would be pretty tall for it, uh, up to two meters. Missouri willow is a much larger shrub. Uh, it can get up to three to four meters tall. And you can see the trunks here, much, much larger trunks. So it's, it's almost getting to the point where it's almost becoming a small tree. So that's one, one other thing that's really different. Um, here again, we can see the pubescence on the undersurface of the leaf right here on prairie willow. The whole plant on um, prairie willow is pretty hairy. This is showing the twigs and some buds. You see a lot of hairs there. And here's the fruit, the capsule, lots of hairs on it. Here, by the way, is, is that scale that sits below the, the um, flowers, both the pistillate and staminate flowers, that little scale that we saw in the di diagram. Prairie willow grows uh, in um, multi, many stem, multi stem clumps. Um, and again, Missouri willow does the same, but, but usually probably more, more stems uh, in, in prairie willow. The other thing that is kind of interesting here is that the, if, you are, if you're there to see the staminate flowers, the staminate catkins, on prairie willow, the um, anthers, which are at the very tip of the stamens, you know, the anthers are where the pollen is, those can be quite colorful. They, they can, it can be different colors depending upon the stage that the um, ant, anther is in. They can be orange, they can be yellow, they can be purple, they can be brown. You can see some of those colors there. Uh, another important thing is that you see over here for Missouri willow, um, it almost always has really prominent stipules. We can see some stipules right here, right here, right here, but then I also put up a close up picture of the twig and some pretty significant stipules there. Those are getting to the size of foliosus. Now, another name for Missouri willow, I, I don't, I use Missouri willow because it's a better name, I think, uh, because another common name you'll, you'll see is heart leafed willow, but at no time do you ever see any leaves that have a heart shape. So I don't know where that name came from. Um, sometimes, uh, and there's a couple of species that do this, sometimes uh, the heart leaf, or excuse me, the heart leaf, the Missouri willow, and there's another species that does this as well. Uh, the leaves will be somewhat reddish early in the spring. So that can be helpful. And let's see, and just a picture of some stamina catkins there. Okay, now we can move on to the 
last three. We've got, these are the three that have uh, really, well, relatively speaking, shorter leaves. They still have leaves that are um, usually at least two and a half times longer than they are wide. But again, uh, they'll be less than five times longer than they are wide. It's got, and it's the bog willow, bebs willow, and pussy willow. And again, I have a little key there with some couplets to separate them out. And we're going to use again the pubescence uh, of vegetative character because it works really, <clears throat> excuse me, works really well here. The leaves are glabrous, and I mean totally glabrous. There's just no hairs anywhere, and the lower part of the leaf is somewhat glaucous. Uh, by the way, that when you see plus minus in a in a used in a botanical uh, context, it it means more or less, or you know, most of the time. Uh, you, you'll see again a big difference here in the, the ventral surface here on bog willow. Bog willow is usually grows usually as a um, well, kind of like uh, sage willow, just a few stems. They, they don't they don't form really large number of of like multi-stem clumps or anything. Both bog willow and sage willow then both occur in peatlands. Both can occur in peatlands. So again, you'd have to be someplace like that if you're going to expect to see one. But bog willow is much, much more restricted to a, a real peatland. If you look at locations for bog willow in Iowa, it's always going to be someplace where there's really well-developed peat. I found it in a site up in northeast Iowa in Clayton County in a shrub car peatland, um, which is sort of like a bog. And it also occurs on, on fence. The other thing about it is that it has um, usually sort of an ob lanceolate or oblong shape. Uh, we see that also with Bev's willow and also with pussy willow. Uh, ob lanceolate or oblong or obovate simply means that the shape of the leaf is such that the leaf gets wider the further out you go. So the, the, the tip of the leaf is broader than the base of the leaf. So this would be oblanceolate. This would be oblanceolate. These over here would be oblong. Okay, so again, that's how you separate bog willow from Bev's willow and pussy willow. Um, Bev's willow and pussy willow can be separated based on the same kind of characteristic that we used in the previous slide to, um, to uh, separate uh, prairie willow and uh, Missouri willow, I think it was. White reddish hairs. Again, well, again, first of all, leaves pubescent, at least on the petiole, that separates these, both of these from bog willow. And then what kind of pubescence though? Well, again, white reddish hairs on the lower blade. Uh, here we see mostly white. Uh, Bebs willow. If their hairs are confined really to just the petiole, and not really to the blade, then that's pussy willow. Pussy willow over here. Uh, Bev's willow and pussy willow are very similar looking in many regards. They're, they can both, uh, they're both shrubs, can be large shrubs. They can both be, I get to the point of being a small tree, although Bev's willow can get a little bit bigger in size as, as, as small tree goes. Um, uh, but again, it's that, that important characteristic Bev's willow is going to be pubescent on the underside of the leaf, and pussy willow is going to be glabrous on the underside of the leaf and have the hairs, and there aren't going to be a lot, but there will usually be at least some hairs present on the petiole. Uh, both Bev and pussy willow have hairy first year branchlets and, and petioles. Um, so there's general hairiness on both of them. But again, it's, it's that ventral leaf surface that you have to pay attention to. Uh, in pussy willow, the catkins come out pretty well way before the leaves. That can be helpful. Here I show a little uh, bee of some kind pollinating, at least uh, searching um, the catkins there. Um, Whereas in Bev willow, the catkins come out sort of simultaneous with the leaves, maybe just slightly before the leaves. Um, again, that's the difference you'd notice if you're out there early in the spring. 
All right, the last slide is just a little bit on ecology of salix. A couple of things to point out here. <clears throat> Most Salix species are really good at colonizing disturbances. That's sort of their function in ecosystems, you might say. Uh, they play a major role in, uh, in revegetating disturbed areas, which then, of course, helps to stabilize those disturbed areas and prevent some erosion. Uh, as colonizers of this disturbed area, they are uh, potentially then, you know, kind of paving the way uh, for other species. Although in most cases, what we're talking about here is probably secondary succession. And so in secondary succession, the, the soil is, is usually pretty fertile. However, uh, some of these disturbed areas, as you can see in these three slides here, uh, are sandbars or gravel bars along streams. And of course, sandbars and gravel bars along streams are not gonna have a lot of fer fertility. Um, depends how much silt, I suppose, gets gets mixed in there. But uh, so they're they're early successional species in these these damp environments. They are able to produce a lot of seed. Now, probably uh, tens of thousands of seeds, probably from an individual plant. You think about um, a pistillate catkin. A pistillate catkin could have probably anywhere from ten to probably at least thirty pistolate flowers. Each of those pistolate flowers has a carpal, or excuse me, has an ovary formed of two, two carpals. And those ovaries have anywhere from probably about 10 to 30 ovules, which become seeds. So a single pistolate catkin could produce 100 seeds. <laughs> and a single tree could have hundreds of pistolate cat catkins. So we're talking about a lot of potential seed, of course, being, being made. And the seed is, is, is commos. It has, again, here's a picture of a seed right up here, that tuft of hairs that um, occurs at one end of the seed. That's what commos means, or well, the term commos means having a coma, and a coma refers to that, this tuft of, of hairs. So they're very easily wind dispersed and uh, they can be lifted up into the air, of course, by, by wind currents, and there's little parachutes that the seeds have and, and be carried for hundreds of meters, maybe even far, further in, in a really good, good wind. The seeds are really light, and that helps with wind dispersal, of, of course, as well. They are so light, they really don't have any, or uh, not much, of any endosperm. And so, there's no food storage that's typically found in these seeds. So when these seeds land, uh, it's, it's germinate or pretty much die. Uh, they don't have much seed dorm dormancy. So seeds that don't land in a good place for germination uh, are, not gonna are not going to make it. Those that do land, uh, those seedlings then uh, of course, they get started growing. They're able to tap into the nutrients in the soil. They need a lot of light. So one thing that salix need is they they can't they, the seedling cannot be successful and establish well if if there's shade. So that's again why they uh, have this you know strong relationship with um, areas that have been disturbed. Now the timing for the willows, the fact that they you know are producing flowers, one of the first trees uh, to really, you know, get going in the spring, catkins coming out in late April, early May, getting the seed produced, uh, you know, by May. Uh, so that that timing of seed dispersal coincides with the receding of spring floods. Spring flooding will have occurred and waters will begin receding about that time of the year in mid-May or so. Leaving, leaving behind potential disturbed areas and you know, mud bars and places where uh, willows have a good chance to, to grow. The other thing then you see here is uh, host for parasitic in insects. Uh, for some reason, and I, I think probably the reason probably is the willow foil foliage, the growth of willows, since willows grow pretty quick, uh, is that the willow foliage is pretty new, has pretty high nutrition. 
In other words, that's one reason that beavers like to eat them, of course, is because the nutritional uh, aspects of the foliage and the branches is fairly high. That's something that again kind of goes along with something that, that grows fast. And so that might be one reason for all these parasitic um, uh, saw flies and midges and mites and so forth that, that form galls on, on leaves. So you see four examples of different galls here. One paper showed that there were at least 200 or more species of saw flies that parasitize and form galls on willows. The one on the far uh, left over here is a, uh, those are the galls of a, a gall midge. Um, the one in the next one over here with that are kind of bumpy and, and reddish in color in some places. That one is, uh, those are galls that are formed from a mite. This is one that you may have seen on willows. This is called the pine cone gall. And it's a gall that forms on the tips of, of willows, uh, willow shrubs. The um, insect here is a, let's see, uh, it's a, a midge, a gall midge. And then the last one over here, this one that is kind of reddish in color, that's a uh, species of sawfly. Yeah, it's forming that one. And of course, galls, as you, if you don't know what a gall is, you're seeing them right here, of course. And what galls are is the sort of response that a plant has to uh, this intrusion of an insect that's laid an egg into their tissue. And this egg is hatched and a larva now is starting to consume tissue. And, and one idea here certainly is that by forming this gall, what a gall represents is um, it's expendable tissue. It's tissue that the plant um, is not necessarily going to miss. It, it's faced with this uh, challenge, basically. You've got a larval form of an insect uh, tunneling through your leaf tissue or wherever it is, eating tissue. You would like it not to eat your mesophyll tissue, the mesophyll tissue that is involved in photosynthesis. And so by making this uh, expendable accessory tissue in the gall, it kind of isolates the activity of the parasite to that gall and provides, in a sense, provides food to keep it away from the more important tissue. Now, these pine cone galls are kind of interesting in that some research has been done with them. And although, again, it's, it's a midge that uh, forms the gall, that initiates the gall, and then it's a kind of a response of the plant to form that tissue, um, there have been uh, studies that have shown that these pine cone galls, because of their size and probably because of, I suppose, maybe the cover or something that they provide, that if you tear them apart, you can find lots of other insects in there that are not the insects that instigated the gall in the first place. One research uh, study, they collected uh, 23 of these pine cone galls and they found 564 insects, different insects and, and individuals of insects in those. And only 15 of these of those galls actually contain the original uh, midge that instigated the gall in the first place. So something's going on there um, in terms of sort of a gall community. Uh, and I'm not sure again what, if anyone knows for sure what those insects are gaining or what they're doing there, uh, if they're just eating some of that tissue as well taking advantage of the tissue that was, again, made in response to, to the midge or, or what. All right, uh, that's it. Time for some questions. There were a couple I was going to address that uh, were asked, I think, at break time. One of them is, what about, what, what about this book? Um, Peter van der Linden, Donna Farrar, Forest and Shade Trees of Iowa. This is the third edition, uh, the most recent one. And I would say a good improvement over the others because it's got color pictures. That's a little bit smaller in size, <clears throat> a little bit handier to use. Or you can certainly use this. But uh, the, the key in this book is a key just to those tree species. Will not include the shrub species. 
And so, yeah, you can key out black willow. You can key out, we can actually key out, uh, well, those five, those six species that I mentioned that get to tree size. So peach leaf is in there. Uh, pussy willow's in, no, I don't think pussy willow's in there. Um, surprisingly, sandbar willow's in there. Um, Missouri willow's in there. Some of the non-native willows are in there, black willow's in there. But I find it, you know, not to be that helpful because it's just a, a selection of, only about half of the willows, uh, if even that, five or six of the willows that are native. And then I think uh, the other question was about endemism and conservatism. Yeah. Is that right, Lance? Well, so endemism is when a plant is only known to occur within a certain sort of confined geographic location. So you could say a, a plant is uh, endemic to a certain area if, if again, the only known populations are, are found within that, that, that place. So as an example, just to make something up, you know, maybe, maybe the only known location of, of a, a species of plant is Polk County or something like that, then you could say that that plant is endemic to that county. Uh, conservatism is, is addresses a different question. Um, conservatism addresses, again, the idea of how much, I think the best way to describe it is how much affinity a plant has for highly pristine, naturally functioning ecosystems. Uh, and so again, the, it, it's also a sort of way of measuring what is a plant's tolerance, or I should put it another way, um, what is a plant's dislike for human disturbance? Species that have high conservatism have a high dislike for human disturbance. They, they can't deal with the disturbances humans cause. Um, again, species that have a low coefficient of conservatism are species that are deemed to be uh, good at colonizing disturbances. And in some cases, they even thrive on human disturbances. Human disturbances have actually probably favored those species, have made them more abundant, whereas if a species is a high conservative, high conservatism species, then human disturbances will be negative for that species. And it's, uh, again, it's, it's based on just uh, the observations that a group of people have made over their lifetime for the most part and where they have tend to, to see species. I always tell people a good way of thinking about what a five or a six or a three mean. If, if, uh, if the coefficient is four, that means to me that if someone brought me that plant, I had no idea where they got it, that they found it someplace and they brought it to me and identified as, oh, it's this species and it has a coefficient of conservatism of four. I could, I would say, well, there's a 40% chance that wherever you got this species, there's a 40% chance that habitat is a high natural pristine environment. Just a 40% chance of that because the coefficient was, is only four. Obviously if the coefficient was eight or nine, then you're almost guaranteed that that's where it must have come from because what that means is that's the only place that they're found. Now, endemism, again, is something separate from that. Uh, that's that's going to, uh, there can be a relationship, of course, between them, but it's looking at something different. Endemism can, is going to be more of a product of a species biogeographical range. And, you know, um, lots of other factors in terms of how well it has, it can spread. And, and it's certainly also going to be representative of sort of how it responds to disturbance too. But when we, when we look at coefficients of conservatism, we are not trying, we're not trying to factor in anything that's related to rarity because conservatism does not mean rarity. Uh, again, rarity and endemism are other, other types of characteristics. Does that work? <laughs> Anything else there on the question? I think so. Yeah, we just got a couple. Um, what species of salix have you noted on pine cone galls? Oh, what, what species carry pine cone gall? Yeah. Is that the question? 
Oh boy, I can't remember for sure. I mean, I've seen it um, quite often. Oh gosh, um, I, I know. I don't think it's really limited too much on any particular species. Let's see. I'm trying to think if I if I know what species that one is on right there in the picture. It doesn't say what the species is that it's on there. Um, but co but common species for sure. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, again, I, I'm guessing that there were, they could have been peach leaf, it could have been black willow, could have been, could have even been sandbar willow. Um, those are the species you see most of the time, uh, those three species. As far as, as far as willows go, the ones that you're most likely going to run into and see are black willow, peach leaf willow, and sand, sandbar. Um, those are the three that I record almost all the time in floristic lists. So I'm guessing, you know, uh, it's probably those species where I've seen it. Okay. Um, we have one comment where, uh, let's see, Argus's treaties on the Salix of Wisconsin is useful. And it's downloadable from the University of Wisconsin Arboretum. And then the last question we have is, what is the difference between a coma and a pappus? Oh, that's a good question. So a coma again is a tuft of hairs that comes off of the tip or end of a seed. So its origin is from the seed coat of a seed. A pappus is a similar kind of structure, certainly in terms of what its function is, but it arises from the a modified calyx, a mod the, the sepals of an Asteraceae flower, uh, a plant in the Asteraceae family, where the calyx is modified in a number of different ways. One way is to be modified to have, have capillary bristles and therefore kind of look like a coma. But other papi are modified into uh, little on-like structures, little scale-like structures, or or um, other types of structures that are certainly not bristles. The, the difference there again is, is one is coming from a seed coat and one is coming from a flower part. Okay, that's all we got right now. Okay, well, let me get that out over here. I'm trying to get out of the share. Here we go. Stop share. There we go. All right. Um, well, thanks for coming again, everybody. It looks like we got over over 20. So hopefully you learned something about uh, willows tonight. And that will be helpful as you uh, look at the spring flora coming up here in another month. Next week is uh, seed mixes, right? Yep. Well, that's when I hope lots of people come and attend because one of the things I have the biggest concern about is people making seed mixes and not really understanding the important factors that should be considered when you design a seed mix. And so next week we'll be talking about that in part in conjunction with designing seed mixes to be appropriate, of course, for your place and location and environment, but also appropriate for climate change. Because I think one of the things we have to think about now as we design reconstructed prairies and mixes is uh, we're gonna be seeing more and more climate change uh, factors uh, influencing the environment. And so making those um, as resilient as possible to unforeseen and you know somewhat unpredictable climate. So I hope to see you next week. Yep. See you later. Thanks, Tom. And thanks to everyone for joining.